This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by A. R. Dobbs, San Francisco, California. Adam Bede by George Eliot. So that ye may have clear images before your gladdened eyes of nature's unambitious underwood and flowers that prosper in the shade. And when I speak of such among the flock as swerved or fell, those only shall be singled out upon whose lapse or error something more than brotherly forgiveness may attend. Wordsworth. Book One, Chapter One The Workshop. With a single drop of ink for a mirror, the Egyptian sorcerer undertakes to reveal to any chance comer far-reaching visions of the past. This is what I undertake to do for you, reader. With this drop of ink at the end of my pen, I will show you the roomy workshop of Mr. Jonathan Burge, carpenter and builder in the village of Hayslope, as it appeared on the 18th of June, in the year of our Lord, 1799. The afternoon sun was warm on the five workmen there, busy upon doors and window frames and wainscoting. A scent of pine wood from a tent-like pile of planks outside the open door mingled itself with the scent of the elder bushes which were spreading their summer snow close to the open window opposite. The slanting sunbeams shone through the transparent shavings that flew before the steady plane and lit up the fine grain of the oak panelling which stood propped against the wall. On a heap of those soft shavings a rough grey shepherd dog had made himself a pleasant bed, and was lying with his nose between his four paws, occasionally wrinkling his brows to cast a glance at the tallest of the five workmen, who was carving a shield in the centre of a wooden mantelpiece. It was to this workman that the strong baritone belonged, which was heard above the sound of plane and hammer, singing— Awake, my soul, and with the sun thy daily stage of duty run. Shake off dull sloth. Here some measurement was to be taken which required more concentrated attention, and the sonorous voice subsided into a low whistle, but it presently broke out again with renewed vigour. Let all thy converse be sincere, thy conscience as the noonday clear. Such a voice could only come from a broad chest, and the broad chest belonged to a large-boned, muscular man nearly six feet high, with a back so flat and a head so well poised, that when he drew himself up to take a more distant survey of his work, he had the air of a soldier standing at ease. The sleeve rolled up above the elbow showed an arm that was likely to win the prize for feats of strength. Yet the long supple hand, with its broad finger-tips, looked ready for works of skill. In his tall stalwartness Adam Bede was a Saxon, and justified his name. But the jet-black hair, made the more noticeable by its contrast with the light paper cap, and the keen glance of the dark eyes that shone from under strongly marked prominent and mobile eyebrows indicated a mixture of Celtic blood. The face was large and roughly hewn, and when in repose had no other beauty than such as belongs to an expression of good-humoured, honest intelligence. It is clear at a glance that the next workman is Adam's brother. He is nearly as tall, he has the same type of features, the same hue of hair and complexion. But the strength of the family likeness seems only to render more conspicuous the remarkable difference of expression both in form and face. Seth's broad shoulders have a slight stoop. His eyes are grey, his eyebrows have less prominence and more repose than his brother's. And his glance, instead of being keen, is confiding and benign. He has thrown off his paper cap and you see that his hair is not thick and straight like Adam's, but thin and wavy, allowing you to discern the exact contour of a coronal arch that predominates very decidedly over the brow. The idle tramps always felt sure they could get a copper from Seth. They scarcely ever spoke to Adam. The concert of the tools and Adam's voice was at last broken by Seth, who, lifting the door at which he had been working intently, placed it against the wall, and said, "'There! I've finished my door to-day, anyhow.' The workmen all looked up. 
Jim Salt, a burly, red-haired man, known as Sandy Jim, paused from his planing, and Adam said to Seth, with a sharp glance of surprise, "'What? Dost think thee'st finished the door?' "'Ay, sure,' said Seth, with answering surprise. "'What's a-wanting to it?' A loud roar of laughter from the other three workmen made Seth look round confusedly. Adam did not join in the laughter, but there was a slight smile on his face, as he said in a gentler tone than before, "'Why, thee'st forgot the panels.' The laughter burst out afresh, as Seth clapped his hands to his head, and coloured over brow and crown. Hooray! shouted a small, lithe fellow called Wiry Ben, running forward and seizing the door. "'We'll hang up the door at the fur end of the shop, and write on it, Seth B. the Methody, his work. Here, Jim, lens hold of the red pot.' "'Nonsense,' said Adam. "'Let it alone, Ben Cranage. You'll mayhap be making such a slip yourself some day. You'll laugh at the other side of your mouth, then. "'Catch me at it, Adam. It'll be a good while afore my head's full of the methodies,' said Ben. "'Nay, but it's often full of drink, and that's worse.' Ben, however, had now got the red pot in his hand, and was about to begin writing his inscription, making, by way of preliminary, an imaginary S in the air. "'Let it alone, will you?' Adam called out, laying down his tools, striding up to Ben, and seizing his right shoulder. "'Let it alone, or I'll shake the soul out wi' your body!' Ben shook in Adam's iron grasp, but, like a plucky small man as he was, he didn't mean to give in. With his left hand he snatched the brush from his powerless right, and made a movement as if he would perform the feat of writing with his left. In a moment Adam turned him round, seized his other shoulder, and, pushing him along, pinned him against the wall. But now Seth spoke up. "'Let be, Addy, let be. Ben will be joking. Why, he's the right to laugh at me. I can help laughing at myself. "'I shan't lose him till he promises to let the door alone,' said Adam. "'Come, Ben, lad,' said Seth, in a persuasive tone. "'Don't let's have a quarrel about it. You know Adam will have his way.' You may as well try to turn a wagon in a narrow lane. Say you'll leave the door alone, and make an end on it. "'I've been affrighted at Adam,' said Bin, "'but I don't mind saying as I'll let alone at your asking, Seth.' "'Come, that's wise of you, Bin,' said Adam, laughing and relaxing his grasp. They all returned to their work now, but wiry Ben, having had the worst in the bodily contest, was bent on retrieving that humiliation by a success in sarcasm. "'Which was you thinking on, Seth?' he began. "'The pretty parson's face, or her sarment, when you forgot the panels?' "'Come and hear her, Ben,' said Seth, good-humouredly. "'She's going to preach on the green to-night. "'Happen you'd get something to think on yourself, then, "'instead of those wicked songs you're so fond on. Ye might get religion, and that'd be the best day's earnings ye ever made. All oh, a good time for that, Seth. I'll think about that when I'm a-goin' to settle in life. Bachelors doesn't want such heavy earnings. Happen I'll do the courtin' and the religion both together, as ye do, Seth. But ye wouldn't a ha' me get converted and chop in atween ye and that pretty preacher and carry her aff. "'No fear of that, Ben. She's neither for you nor for me to win, I doubt. Only you come and hear her, and you won't speak lightly on her again.' "'Well, I'm a half a mind to ha' a look at her to-night, if there isn't good company at the holly-bush. What'll she take for her text? Happen ye can tell me, Seth, if so be I shouldn't a come up a time for it. Will it be... What come ye out for to see? A prophetess? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophetess, a uncommon pretty young woman. Come, Ben, said Adam rather sternly. You let the words of the Bible alone. You're going too far now. What are ye a turning round, Adam? I thought ye were dead again the woman preaching a while ago. Nay, I'm not turning no way. I said naught about the women preaching. I said, you let the Bible alone. You've got a jest book, hand you, as you're rare and proud on. Keep your dirty fingers to that. Why, you're getting as big a saint as Seth. 
"'You're going to the preaching to-night, I should think. "'You'll do finely to lead the singing. "'But I don't know what Parson Irwin'll say "'at his grand favorite Adam Bede, a turnin' Methody. "'Never do you bother yourself about me, Ben. "'I'm not a-going to turn Methodist any more nor you are, "'though it's like enough you'll turn to something worse. "'Mester Irwin's got more sense nor to meddle with people's doin' as they like in religion.' "'That's between themselves and God, as he says to me many a time. "'Aye, aye, but he's none so fond o' your dissenters for all that. "'Maybe I'm none so fond o' Josh Todd's thick ale, "'but I don't hinder you from making a fool o' yourself wit.' "'There was a laugh at this thrust of Adam's, but Seth said very seriously, "'Nay, nay, Addy, thee must na say as anybody's religion's like thick ale.' Thee dost na believe but what the dissenters and the Methodists have got the root of the matter as well as the church folks. Nay, saith lad, I'm not for laughing at no man's religion. Let em follow their consciences, that's all. Only I think it'd be better if their consciences had let em stay quiet in the church. There's a deal to be learnt there. And there's such a thing as being over spiritual. We must have something besides gospel of this world. Look at the canals and the aqueducts, and the coal-pit engines, and Arkwright's mills there at Cromford. A man must learn summit beside gospel to make them things, I reckon. But to hear some of them preachers, you'd think, as a man must be doing nothing all his life but shutting his eyes and looking what's a going on inside him. I know a man must have the love of God in his soul, and the Bible's God's word. But what does the Bible say? Why, it says, as God put his spirit into the workman, as built the tabernacle, to make him do all the carved work and things as wanted a nice hand. And this is my way of looking at it. There's the spirit of God in all things and all times, weekday as well as Sunday, and in the great works and inventions, and in the figuring and the mechanics. And God helps us with our headpieces and our hands as well as with our souls. And if a man does bits o' jobs out o' working hours, builds a oven for his wife to save her from going to the bake-house, or scrats at his bit o' garden and makes two potatoes grow instead o' one, he's doin' more good, and he's just as near to God as if he was runnin' after some preacher and a prayin' and a groanin'. "'Well done, Adam,' said Sandy Jim, who had paused from his planing to shift his planks while Adam was speaking." "'That's the best sermon I've heard this long while. "'By the same token, my wife's been a plaguing on me "'to build her oven this twelvemonth. "'There's reason in what thee sayest, Adam,' observed Seth gravely. "'But thee knowest thyself, as it's hearing the preachers "'thee find'st so much fault with, "'has turned many an idle man into an industrious un. "'It's the preacher as empties the ale-house, "'and if a man gets religion,' "'He'll do his work none the worse for that.' "'Only he'll have the panels out of the doors sometimes, eh, Seth?' said Wiry Ben. "'Ah, Ben, you've got a joke again me as'll last you your life. "'But it isn't a religion as was a fault there. "'It was Seth Bede, as was all as a wool-gathering chap, "'and religion hasn't cured him, the more's the pity.' "'Ne'er heed me, Seth,' said Wiry Ben. "'You are a downright good-hearted chap, panels or no panels. "'And you dinna set up your bristles at every bit of fun, "'like some of your kin, as is mayhap cliverer. "'Seth, lad,' said Adam, taking no notice of the sarcasm against himself, "'thee must na take me unkind. "'I was na driving at thee, and what I said just now. "'Some has got one way of looking at things, and some has got another.' "'Nay, nay, Addy, thee means me no unkindness.' said Seth. I know that well enough. Thee't like thy dog, Jip. Thee barks at me sometimes, but thee always licks my hand after. All hands worked on in silence for some minutes, until the church clock began to strike six. Before the first stroke had died away, Sandy Jim had loosed his plane and was reaching his jacket. Wiry Ben had left a screw half-driven in, and thrown his screwdriver into his tool-basket. Mum Taft, who, true to his name, had kept silence throughout the previous conversation, had flung down his hammer as he was in the act of lifting it, and Seth, too, had straightened his back, and was putting out his hand towards his paper cap. Adam alone had gone on with his work as if nothing had happened. 
but observing the cessation of the tools, he looked up, and said in a tone of indignation, "'Look there now! I can't abide to see men throw away their tools of that way, the minute the clock begins to strike, as if they took no pleasure of their work, and was afraid of doing a stroke too much.' Seth looked a little conscious, and began to be slower in his preparations for going. But Mum Taft broke silence, and said, "'Ay, ay, Adam, lad, ye talk like a young'un. When ye are six and forty like me, stood a six and twenty, ye wanna be so flush a workin' for naught?' "'Nonsense!' said Adam, still wrathful. "'What's age got to do with it, I wonder?' Ye are in a getting stiff yet, I reckon. I hate to see a man's arms drop down as if he was shot before the clock's fairly struck, just as if he'd never a bit of pride and delight in's work. The very grindstone'll go on turnin' a bit after you loose it. Botheration, Adam! exclaimed Wiry Ben. Lave a chap alone, will ye? Ye were a findin' fout with preachers a while ago. Ye are fond enough o' preachin' yoursen. Ye may like work better nor play, but I like play better nor work. That'll accommodate ye. It laves ye the more to do. With this exit speech, which he considered effective, Wiry Ben shouldered his basket and left the workshop, quickly followed by Mum Taft and Sandy Jim. Seth lingered and looked wistfully at Adam, as if he expected him to say something. Shalt go home before thee goes to the preaching? Adam asked, looking up. "'Nay, I've got my hat and things at Will Maskery's. "'I shan't be home before going for ten. "'I'll happen see Dinah Morris safe home, if she's willing. "'There's nobody comes with her from Poysers, thee knowest.' "'Then I'll tell Mother not to look for thee,' said Adam. "'Thee art na going to Poysers thyself to-night?' said Seth, rather timidly, "'as he turned to leave the workshop. "'Nay, I'm going to the school.' Hitherto Jip had kept his comfortable bed, only lifting up his head and watching Adam more closely as he noticed the other workmen departing. But no sooner did Adam put his ruler in his pocket and begin to twist his apron round his waist than Jip ran forward and looked up in his master's face with patient expectation. If Jip had had a tail he would doubtless have wagged it, but being destitute of that vehicle for his emotions he was, like many other worthy personages, destined to appear more phlegmatic than nature had made him. "'What? Art ready for the basket, eh, Jip?' said Adam, with the same gentle modulation of voice as when he spoke to Seth. Jip jumped and gave a short bark, as much as to say, "'Of course!' Poor fellow, he had not a great range of expression. The basket was the one which on workdays held Adam's and Seth's dinner, and no official, walking in procession, could look more resolutely unconscious of all acquaintances than Jip with his basket, trotting at his master's heels. On leaving the workshop, Adam locked the door, took the key out, and carried it to the house on the other side of the woodyard. It was a low house with smooth grey thatch and buff walls, looking pleasant and mellow in the evening light. The leaded windows were bright and speckless, and the stone door was as clean as a white boulder at ebb tide. On the doorstone stood a clean old woman in a dark-striped linen gown, a red kerchief, and a linen cap, talking to some speckled fowls which appeared to have been drawn towards her by an illusory expectation of cold potatoes or barley. The old woman's sight seemed to be dim, for she did not recognize Adam till he said, "'Here's the key, Dolly. Lay it down for me in the house, will you?' "'Aye, sure, but when are ye come in, Adam?' "'Miss Mary's i' the house, and Mr. Burge'll be back anon. "'He'd be glad to hae ye to supper wim. I'll be as warrand. "'No, Dolly, thank you. I'm off home. Good evening.' Adam hastened along with long strides, Jip close to his heels, out of the workyard and along the high road leading away from the village and down to the valley. As he reached the foot of the slope, an elderly horseman with his portmanteau strapped behind him, stopped his horse when Adam had passed him, and turned round to have another long look at the stalwart workman in paper cap, leather breeches, and dark blue worsted stockings. Adam, unconscious of the admiration he was exciting, 
presently struck across the fields, and now broke out into the tune which had all day long been running in his head. Let all thy converse be sincere, thy conscience as the noonday clear, for God's all-seeing eye surveys thy secret thoughts, thy works and ways. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Adam Bede This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 2 The Preaching. About a quarter to seven there was an unusual appearance of excitement in the village of Hayslope, and through the whole length of its little street, from the Donathorn Arms to the churchyard gate, the inhabitants had evidently been drawn out of their houses by something more than the pleasure of lounging in the evening sunshine. The Donathorn Arms stood at the entrance of the village, and a small farmyard and stackyard which flanked it, indicating that there was a pretty take of land attached to the inn, gave the traveller a promise of good feed for himself and his horse, which might well console him for the ignorance in which the weather-beaten sign left him as to the heraldic bearings of that ancient family, the Donathorns. Mr. Casson, the landlord, had been for some time standing at the door with his hands in his pockets, balancing himself on his heels and toes, and looking towards a piece of unenclosed ground with a maple in the middle of it, which he knew to be the destination of certain grave-looking men and women whom he had observed passing at intervals. Mr. Casson's person was by no means of that common type which can be allowed to pass without description. On a front view it appeared to consist principally of two spheres, bearing about the same relation to each other as the earth and the moon. That is to say, the lower sphere might be said, at a rough guess, to be thirteen times larger than the upper, which naturally performed the function of a mere satellite and tributary. But here the resemblance ceased, for Mr. Casson's head was not at all a melancholy-looking satellite, nor was it a spotty globe, as Milton has irreverently called the moon. On the contrary, no head and face could look more sleek and healthy, and its expression, which was chiefly confined to a pair of round and ruddy cheeks, the slight knot and interruptions forming the nose and eyes being scarcely worth mention, was one of jolly contentment only tempered by that sense of personal dignity which usually made itself felt in his attitude and bearing. This sense of dignity could hardly be considered excessive in a man who had been butler to the family for fifteen years, and who in his present high position was necessarily very much in contact with his inferiors. How to reconcile his dignity with the satisfaction of his curiosity by walking towards the green was the problem that Mr. Casson had been revolving in his mind for the last five minutes but when he had partly solved it by taking his hands out of his pockets and thrusting them into the armholes of his waistcoat, by throwing his head on one side and providing himself with an air of contemptuous indifference to whatever might fall under his notice, his thoughts were diverted by the approach of the horseman, whom we lately saw pausing to have another look at our friend Adam, and who now pulled up at the door of the Donathorn Arms. "'Take off the bridle and give him a drink, ostler.' said the traveller to the lad in the smock-frock, who had come out of the yard at the sound of the horse's hoofs. "'Why, what's up in your pretty village, landlord?' he continued, getting down. "'There seems to be quite a stir.' "'It's a Methodist preaching, sir. It's been give out as a young woman's a going to preach on the green,' answered Mr. Casson, in a treble and wheezy voice, with a slightly mincing accent. "'Will you please to step in, sir, and take something?' "'No, I must be getting on to Rossiter.' I only want a drink for my horse. And what does your parson say, I wonder, to a young woman preaching just under his nose? Parson Irwine, sir, doesn't live here. He lives at Broxon o'er the hill there. The parsonage here's a tumble-down place, sir, not fit for gentry to live in. He comes here to preach of a Sunday afternoon, sir, and puts up his hoss here. It's a great cob, sir, and he sets great store by it. He always puts up his horse here, sir, ever since before I had the Denethorn Arms. I'm not this countryman, you may tell by my tongue, sir. They're curious talkers of this country, sir. The gentry's hard work to understand em. 
I was brought up among the gentry, sir, and got the turn of their tongue when I was a by. Why, what do you think the folks here says for heaven't you? The gentry, you know, says heaven't you. Well, the people about here says Hannah yea. It's what they call the dialect is spoke here about, sir. That's what I've heard Squire Donathorne say many a time. It's the dialect, says he. Ay, ay, said the stranger, smiling, I know it very well. But you've not got many Methodists about here, surely, in this agricultural spot? I should have thought there would hardly be such a thing as a Methodist to be found about here. You're all farmers, aren't you? The Methodists can seldom lay much hold on them. Why, sir, there's a pretty lot of workmen round about, sir. There's Mr. Burge, as owns the timber yard over there, and he undertakes a good bit of building and repairs. And there's the stone pits not far off. There's plenty of empley in this country, sir. And there's a fine batch of Methodists at Treddleson. That's the market town about three mile off. You will maybe have come through it, sir. There's pretty nigh a score of em on the green now as come from there. That's where our people gets it from, though there's only two men of em in all Hayslope. That's Will Maskery the wheelwright and Seth Bede, the young man as works at the carpentering. The preacher comes from Treddleston, then, does she? Nay, sir, she comes out of Stonyshire, pretty nigh thirty mile off. But she's a visitin' hereabout at Mr. Poyser's at the Hall Farm. It's them barns and big walnut trees right away to the left, sir. She's own niece to Poyser's wife, and they'll be fine and vexed at her for making a fool of herself in that way. But I've heerd, as there's no holdin' these Methodistes when the maggots once got in their head, many of em go stark staring mad with their religion, though this young woman's quiet enough to look at by what I can make out. I've not seen her myself. Well, I wish I had time to wait and see her, but I must get on. I've been out of my way for the last twenty minutes to have a look at that place in the valley. It's Squire Donifluence, I suppose? Yes, sir, that's Donathorne Chase, that is. Fine hoax there, isn't there, sir? I should know what it is, sir, for I've lived butler there a goin' of fifteen year. It's Captain Donathorne as is the heir, sir. Squire Donathorne's grandson. He'll be comin' of hage this a harvest, sir, and we shall have fine doings. He owns all the land about here, sir, Squire Donathorne does. Well, it's a pretty spot, whoever may own it, said the traveller, mounting his horse, and one meets some fine strapping fellows about, too. I met as fine a young fellow as ever I saw in my life about half an hour ago, before I came up the hill. A carpenter, a tall, broad-shouldered fellow with black hair and black eyes, marching along like a soldier. We want such fellows as he to lick the French. Aye, sir, that's Adam Bede, that is, I'll be bound. Thias Bede's son, everybody knows him hereabout. He's an uncommon clever, steady fellow, and wonderful strong. Lord bless you, sir, if you'll excuse me for saying so. He can walk forty mile a day— and left a matter of sixty stun. He's an uncommon favourite with the gentry, sir. Captain Donathorne and Parson Irwine makes a fine fuss with him, but he's a little lifted up and peppery-like. Well, good evening to you, landlord. I must get on. Your servant, sir. Good evening. The traveller put his horse into a quick walk up the village, but when he approached the green, the beauty of the view that lay on his right hand, the singular contrast presented by the groups of villagers with the knot of Methodists near the maple, and perhaps yet more, curiosity to see the young female preacher proved too much for his anxiety to get to the end of his journey, and he paused. The green lay at the extremity of the village, and from it the road branched off in two directions, one leading farther up the hill by the church, and the other winding gently down towards the valley. On the side of the green that led towards the church, the broken line of thatched cottages was continued nearly to the churchyard gate, but on the opposite northwestern side there was nothing to obstruct the view of gently swelling meadow and wooded valley and dark masses of distant hill. That rich undulating district of Loamshire to which Hayslope belonged lies close to a grim outskirt of Stonyshire, and overlooked by its barren hills as a pretty blooming sister may sometimes be seen linked in the arm of a rugged, tall, swarthy brother and in two or three hours' ride the traveller might exchange a bleak treeless region, intersected by lines of cold grey stone, for one where his road wound under the shelter of woods, or up swelling hills, muffled with hedgerows and long meadow-grass and thick corn, and where at every turn he came upon some fine old country seat nestled in the valley or crowning the slope, some homestead with its long length of barn and its cluster of golden ricks, some grey steeple looking out from a pretty confusion of trees and thatch and dark red tiles. It was just such a picture as this last that Hayslope Church had made to the traveller 
as he began to mount the gentle slope leading to its pleasant uplands, and now from his station near the green he had before him in one view nearly all the other typical features of this pleasant land. High up against the horizon were the huge conical masses of hill, like giant mounds intended to fortify this region of corn and grass against the keen and hungry winds of the north, not distant enough to be clothed in purple mystery, but with sombre greenish sides visibly specked with sheep, whose motion was only revealed by memory, not detected by sight, wooed from day to day by the changing hours, but responding with no change in themselves, left forever, grim and sullen after the flush of morning, the winged gleams of the April noonday, the parting crimson glory of the ripening summer sun. And directly below them the eye rested on a more advanced line of hanging woods, divided by bright patches of pasture or furrowed crops, and not yet deepened into the uniform leafy curtains of high summer, but still showing the warm tints of the young oak and the tender green of the ash and lime. Then came the valley, where the woods grew thicker, as if they had rolled down and hurried together from the patches left smooth on the slope, that they might take the better care of the tall mansion which lifted its parapets and sent its faint blue summer smoke among them. Doubtless there was a large sweep of park and a broad glassy pool in front of that mansion, but the swelling slope of meadow would not let our traveller see them from the village green. He saw instead a foreground which was just as lovely, the level sunlight lying like transparent gold among the gently curving stems of the feathered grass, and the tall red sorrel, and the white ambles of the hemlocks lining the bushy hedgerows. It was that moment in summer when the sound of the scythe being wetted makes us cast more lingering looks at the flower-sprinkled tresses of the meadows. He might have seen other beauties in the landscape if he had turned a little in his saddle and looked eastward, beyond Jonathan Burge's pasture and woodyard, towards the green cornfields and walnut trees of the Hall Farm. But apparently there was more interest for him in the living groups close at hand. Every generation in the village was there, from old Father Taft in his brown worsted nightcap, who was bent nearly double, but seemed tough enough to keep on his legs a long while, leaning on his short stick, down to the babies with their little round heads lolling forward in quilted linen caps. Now and then there was a new arrival, perhaps a slouching laborer, who, having eaten his supper, came out to look at the unusual scene with a slow bovine gaze, willing to hear what any one had to say in explanation of it, but by no means excited enough to ask a question. But all took care not to join the Methodists on the green, and identify themselves in that way with the expectant audience for there was not one of them that would not have disclaimed the imputation of having come out to hear the preacher woman. They had only come out to see what were a-goin' on like. The men were chiefly gathered in the neighborhood of the blacksmith's shop. But do not imagine them gathered in a knot. Villagers never swarm. A whisper is unknown among them, and they seem almost as incapable of an undertone as a cow or a stag. Your true rustic turns his back on his interlocutor, throwing a question over his shoulder, as if he meant to run away from the answer, and walking a step or two farther off when the interest of the dialogue culminates. So the group in the vicinity of the blacksmith's door was by no means a close one, and formed no screen in front of Chad Cranage, the blacksmith himself, who stood with his black brawny arms folded, leaning against the doorpost, and occasionally sending forth a bellowing laugh at his own jokes, giving them a marked preference over the sarcasms of Wiry Ben who had renounced the pleasures of the holly-bush for the sake of seeing life under a new form. But both styles of wit were treated with equal contempt by Mr. Joshua Rann. Mr. Rann's leathern apron and subdued griminess can leave no one in any doubt that he is the village shoemaker. The thrusting out of his chin and stomach and the twirling of his thumbs are more subtle indications, intended to prepare unwary strangers for the discovery that they are in the presence of the parish clerk. Old Joshua, as he is irreverently called by his neighbors, is in a state of simmering indignation, but he has not yet opened his lips except to say in a resounding bass undertone, like the tuning of a violoncello, Say on king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever, and Og the king of Basan, for his mercy endureth forever. A quotation which may seem to have a slight bearing on the present occasion, but, as with every other anomaly, adequate knowledge will show it to be a natural sequence. Mr. Rann was inwardly maintaining the dignity of the church in the face of this scandalous eruption of Methodism, 
and as that dignity was bound up with his own sonorous utterance of the responses, his argument naturally suggested a quotation from the psalm he had read the last Sunday afternoon. The stronger curiosity of the women had drawn them quite to the edge of the green, where they could examine more closely the Quaker-like costume and odd deportment of the female Methodists. Underneath the maple there was a small cart which had been brought from the wheelwrights to serve as a pulpit, and round this a couple of benches and a few chairs had been placed. Some of the Methodists were resting on these with their eyes closed, as if wrapped in prayer or meditation. Others chose to continue standing and had turned their faces towards the villagers with a look of melancholy compassion, which was highly amusing to Bessie Cranage, the blacksmith's buxom daughter, known to her neighbors as Chad's Bess who wondered why the folks were a-making faces of Adam's. Chad's Bess was the object of peculiar compassion because her hair, being turned back under a cap which was set at the top of her head, exposed to view an ornament of which she was much prouder than of her red cheeks, namely a pair of large round earrings with false garnets in them. Ornaments condemned not only by the Methodists, but by her own cousin and namesake Timothy's Bess, who, with much cousinly feeling, often wished them earrings might come to good. Timothy's Bess, though retaining her maiden appellation among her familiars, had long been the wife of Sandy Jim, and possessed a handsome set of matronly jewels, of which it is enough to mention the heavy baby she was rocking in her arms, and the sturdy fellow of five in knee-breeches, and red legs, who had a rusty milk-can round his neck by way of drum, and was very carefully avoided by Chad's small terrier. This young olive branch, notorious under the name of Timothy's Bess's Ben, being of an inquiring disposition, unchecked by any false modesty, had advanced beyond the group of women and children, and was walking round the Methodists, looking up in their faces with his mouth wide open and beating his stick against the milk can by way of musical accompaniment. But one of the elderly women bending down to take him by the shoulder with an air of grave remonstrance Timothy's Bess's Ben first kicked out vigorously, then took to his heels and sought refuge behind his father's legs. "'Ye gallows, young dog,' said Sandy Jim, with some paternal pride. "'If ye don't keep that stick quiet, I'll take it from ye. What do ye mean by kicking folks?' "'Here, get here to me, Ben,' said Chad Cranage. "'I'll tires up and shoe em as I do the hosses. "'Well, Maester Casson,' he continued, as that personage sauntered up toward the group of men, "'how are ye to-night? Are ye come to help Groon? They say folks allus groon when they're hearkening to the Methodies, as if they were bad o' the inside. I mean to groon as loud as your cow did the other night, and then the praetor'll think I'm o' the right way. I'd advise you not to be up to no nonsense, Chad, said Mr. Casson, with some dignity. Poyser wouldn't like to hear as his wife's niece was treated any ways disrespectful, for all he mayn't be fond of her taking on herself to preach. Ay, and she's a pleasant looked on too, said Wiry Ben. I'll stick up for the pretty women preaching. I know they'd persuade me over a deal sooner nor the ugly men. I shouldn't wonder if I turn Methody afore the night's out and begin to court the preacher like Seth Bede. Why, Seth's looking rather too high, I should think, said Mr. Casson. This woman's kin wouldn't like her to demean herself to a common carpenter. True, said Ben, with a long treble intonation. What's folks's kin got to do with it? Not a chip. Poyser's wife may turn up her nose and forget bygones, but this Dinah Morris, they tell me, is as poor as ever she was, works at a mill, and's much ado to keep her sin. A strapping young carpenter, as is a ready-made methody like Seth, wouldn't it be a bad match for her? Why, Poyser's make as big a fuss with Adam Bede, as if he were a nevy of her own. Idle talk, idle talk, said Mr. Joshua Rann. Adam and Seth's two men. You want to fit them two with the same last. Maybe, said Wiry Ben, contemptuously, but Seth's the lad for me, though he were a Methody twice o'er. I'm fair be with Seth, for I've been teasing him ever since we've been working together, and he bears me no more malice nor lamb. And he's stout-hearted feller, too, for when we saw the old tree all afire a coming across the fields one night, and we thought as it were a bogey, Seth made no more ado, but he up to it as bold as a constable. Why, there he comes out of Will Maskery's, and there's Will hisself, looking as meek as if he couldn't knock a nail o' the head for fear o' hurtin't. And there's the pretty preacher woman. My eye, she's got her bonnet off. I mun go a bit nearer. Several of the men followed Ben's lead, and the traveller pushed his horse on to the green as Dinah walked rather quickly, 
and in advance of her companions toward the cart under the maple tree. While she was near Seth's tall figure, she looked short, but when she had mounted the cart and was away from all comparison, she seemed above the middle height of woman, though in reality she did not exceed it, an effect which was due to the slimness of her figure and the simple line of her black stuff dress. The stranger was struck with surprise as he saw her approach and mount the cart. Surprise not so much at the feminine delicacy of her appearance as at the total absence of self-consciousness in her demeanor. He had made up his mind to see her advance with a measured step and a demure solemnity of countenance. He had felt sure that her face would be mantled with the smile of conscious saintship or else charged with a denunciatory bitterness. He knew but two types of Methodists the ecstatic, and the bilious. But Dinah walked as simply as if she were going to market, and seemed as unconscious of her outward appearance as a little boy. There was no blush, no tremulousness, which said, I know you think me a pretty woman, too young to preach. No casting up or down of the eyelids, no compression of the lips, no attitude of the arms that said, But you must think of me as a saint. She held no book in her ungloved hands, but let them hang down lightly crossed before her, as she stood and turned her grey eyes on the people. There was no keenness in the eyes. They seemed rather to be shedding love than making observations. They had the liquid look which tells that the mind is full of what it has to give out, rather than impressed by external objects. She stood with her left hand towards the descending sun, and leafy boughs screened her from its rays but in this sober light the delicate colouring of her face seemed to gather a calm vividness, like flowers at evening. It was a small oval face, of a uniform transparent whiteness, with an egg-like line of cheek and chin, a full but firm mouth, a delicate nostril, and a low perpendicular brow, surmounted by a rising arch of parting between smooth locks of pale reddish hair. The hair was drawn straight back behind the ears, and covered, except for an inch or two above the brow, by a net Quaker cap. The eyebrows, of the same color as the hair, were perfectly horizontal and firmly penciled. The eyelashes, though no darker, were long and abundant. Nothing was left blurred or unfinished. It was one of those faces that make one think of white flowers, with light touches of color on their pure petals. The eyes had no peculiar beauty beyond that of expression. They looked so simple, so candid, so gravely loving, that no accusing scowl, no light sneer could help melting away before their glance. Joshua Rand gave a long cough as if he were clearing his throat in order to come to a new understanding with himself. Chad Cranage lifted up his leather skull cap and scratched his head, and Wiry Ben wondered how Seth had the pluck to think of courting her. A sweet woman, the stranger said to himself, but surely nature never meant her for a preacher. Perhaps he was one of those who think that nature has theatrical properties, and, with the considerate view of facilitating art and psychology, makes up her characters so that there may be no mistake about them. But Dinah began to speak. Dear friends, she said in a clear but not loud voice, let us pray for a blessing. She closed her eyes and, hanging her head down a little, continued in the same moderate tone as if speaking to someone quite near her. Saviour of sinners, when a poor woman laden with sins went out to the well to draw water, she found thee sitting at the well. She knew thee not, she had not sought thee, her mind was dark, her life was unholy. But thou didst speak to her, thou didst teach her, thou didst show her that her life lay open before thee, and yet thou wast ready to give her that blessing which she had never sought. Jesus, thou art in the midst of us and thou knowest all men. If there is any here like that poor woman, if their minds are dark, their lives unholy, if they have come out not seeking thee, not desiring to be taught, deal with them according to the free mercy which thou didst show to her. Speak to them, Lord, open their ears to my message, bring their sins to their minds, and make them thirst for that salvation which thou art ready to give. Lord, thou art with thy people still, they see thee in the night watches, and their hearts burn within them as thou talkest with them by the way. And thou art near to those who have not known thee. Open their eyes that they may see. See thee weeping over them and saying, Ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. 
see thee hanging on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See thee as thou wilt come again in thy glory to judge them at the last. Amen. Dinah opened her eyes again and paused, looking at the group of villagers, who were now gathered rather more closely on her right hand. Dear friends, she began, raising her voice a little, you have all of you been to church, and I think you must have heard the clergyman read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus Christ spoke those words. He said he came to preach the gospel to the poor. I don't know whether you ever thought about those words much, but I will tell you when I remember first hearing them. It was on just such a sort of evening as this when I was a little girl, and my aunt has brought me up, took me to hear a good man preach out of doors, just as we are here. I remember his face well. He was a very old man and had very long white hair. His voice was very soft and beautiful, not like any voice I had ever heard before. I was a little girl and scarcely knew anything, and this old man seemed to me such a different sort of man from anybody I had ever seen before, that I thought he had perhaps come down from the sky to preach to us, and I said, Aunt, will he go back to the sky tonight, like the picture in the Bible? That man of God was Mr. Wesley, who spent his life in doing what our blessed Lord did, preaching the gospel to the poor, and he entered into his rest eight years ago. I came to know more about him years after, but I was a foolish, thoughtless child then, and I remembered only one thing he told us in his sermon. He told us his gospel meant good news. The gospel, you know, is what the Bible tells us about God. Think of that now. Jesus Christ did really come down from heaven, as I, like a silly child, thought Mr. Wesley did. And what he came down for was to tell good news about God to the poor. Why, you and me, dear friends, are poor. We have been brought up in poor cottages, and have been reared on oat cake and lived coarse, and we haven't been to school much nor read books, and we don't know much about anything but what happens just round us. We are just the sort of people that want to hear good news. For when anybody's well off, they don't much mind about hearing news from distant parts. But if a poor man or woman's in trouble and has hard work to make out a living, they like to have a letter to tell them they've got a friend as will help them. To be sure, we can't help knowing something about God, even if we've never heard the gospel, the good news that our Savior brought us. For we know everything comes from God. Don't you say almost every day, this and that will happen, please God? And we shall begin to cut the grass soon, please God, to send us a little more sunshine? We know very well we are altogether in the hands of God. We didn't bring ourselves into the world. We can't keep ourselves alive while we're sleeping. The daylight and the wind and the corn and the cows to give us milk. Everything we have comes from God. And he gave us our souls and put love between parents and children and husband and wife. But is that as much as we want to know about God? We see he is great and mighty and can do what he will. We are lost as if we were struggling in great waters when we try to think of him. But perhaps doubts come into your mind like this. Can God take much notice of us poor people? Perhaps he only made the world for the great and the wise and the rich. It doesn't cost him much to give us our little handful of victual and bit of clothing. But how do we know he cares for us any more than we care for the worms and things in the garden, so as we rear our carrots and onions? Will God take care of us when we die? And has he any comfort for us when we are lame and sick and helpless? Perhaps, too, he is angry with us, else why does the blight come and the bad harvests and the fever and all sorts of pain and trouble? For our life is full of trouble, and if God sends us good, he seems to send bad, too. How is it? How is it? Ah, dear friends, we are in sad want of good news about God. And what does other good news signify if we haven't that? For everything else comes to an end, and when we die we leave it all. But God lasts when everything else is gone. What shall we do if he is not our friend? Then Dinah told how the good news had been brought, and how the mind of God towards the poor had been made manifest in the life of Jesus, dwelling on its lowliness and its acts of mercy. So you see, dear friends, she went on, Jesus spent his time almost all in doing good to poor people. He preached out of doors to them, and he made friends of poor workmen, and taught them and took pains with them. Not but what he did good to the rich, too, for he was full of love to all men. Only he saw as the poor were more in want of his help. So he cured the lame and the sick and the blind, and he worked miracles to feed the hungry, because he said he was sorry for them, 
and he was very kind to the little children and comforted those who had lost their friends, and he spoke very tenderly to poor sinners that were sorry for their sins. Ah, oh, wouldn't you love such a man if you saw him, if he were here in this village? What a kind heart he must have, what a friend he would be to go to in trouble, how pleasant it must be to be taught by him. Well, dear friends, who was this man? Was he only a good man? A very good man, and no more, like our dear Mr. Wesley, who has been taken from us? He was the Son of God. In the image of the Father, the Bible says, that means just like God, who is the beginning and end of all things, the God we want to know about. So then, all the love that Jesus showed to the poor is the same love that God has for us. We can understand what Jesus felt because he came in a body like ours and spoke words such as we speak to each other. We were afraid to think what God was before, the God who made the world and the sky and the thunder and lightning. We could never see him. We could only see the things he had made, and some of these things was very terrible, so as we might well tremble when we thought of him. But our blessed Saviour has showed us what God is in a way us poor ignorant people can understand. He has showed us what God's heart is, what are his feelings towards us. But let us see a little more about what Jesus came on earth for. Another time he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And another time, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The lost! Sinners! Dear friends, does that mean you and me? Hitherto the traveller had been chained to the spot against his will by the charm of Dinah's mellow treble tones, which had a variety of modulation like that of a fine instrument, touched with the unconscious skill of musical instinct. The simple things she said seemed like novelties, as a melody strikes us with a new feeling when we hear it sung by the pure voice of a boyish chorister. The quiet depth of conviction with which she spoke seemed in itself an evidence for the truth of her message. He saw that she had thoroughly arrested her hearers. The villagers had pressed nearer to her, and there was no longer anything but grave attention on all faces. She spoke slowly, though quite fluently, often pausing after a question, or before any transition of ideas. There was no change of attitude, no gesture. The effect of her speech was produced entirely by the inflections of her voice. And when she came to the question, Will God take care of us when we die? She uttered it in such a tone of plaintive appeal that the tears came into some of the hardest eyes. The stranger had ceased to doubt, as he had done at first glance, that she could fix the attention of her rougher hearers, but still he wondered whether she could have that power of rousing their more violent emotions, which must surely be a necessary seal of her vocation as a Methodist preacher, until she came to the words, Lost! Sinners! When there was a great change in her voice and manner, she had made a long pause before the exclamation, and the pause seemed to be filled by agitating thoughts that showed themselves in her features. Her pale face became paler, the circles under her eyes deepened, as they did when tears half gather without falling, and the mild, loving eyes took an expression of appalled pity, as if she had suddenly discerned a destroying angel hovering over the heads of the people. Her voice became deep and muffled, but there was still no gesture. Nothing could be less like the ordinary type of the ranter than Dinah. She was not preaching as she heard others preach, but speaking directly from her own emotions and under the inspiration of her own simple faith. But now she had entered into a new current of feeling. Her manner became less calm, her utterance more rapid and agitated, as she tried to bring home to the people their guilt, their willful darkness, their state of disobedience to God, as she dwelt on the hatefulness of sin, the divine holiness, and the sufferings of the Saviour, by which a way had been opened for their salvation. At last it seemed as if, in her yearning desire to reclaim the lost sheep, she could not be satisfied by addressing her hearers as a body, she appealed first to one and then to another, beseeching them with tears to turn to God while there was yet time, painting to them the desolation of their souls, lost in sin, feeding on the husks of this miserable world, far away from God their Father, and then the love of the Saviour who was waiting and watching for their return. There was many a responsive sigh and groan from her fellow Methodists, but the village mind does not easily take fire and a little smouldering vague anxiety that might easily die out again was the utmost effect Dinah's preaching had wrought in them at present. Yet no one had retired, except the children and old Father Taft, who, being too deaf to catch many words, had some time ago gone back to his inglenook. 
Wiry Ben was feeling very uncomfortable, and almost wishing he had not come to hear Dinah. He thought what she said would haunt him somehow. Yet he couldn't help liking to look at her and listen to her, though he dreaded every moment that she would fix her eyes on him and address him in particular. She had already addressed Sandy Jim, who was now holding the baby to relieve his wife, and the big, soft-hearted man had rubbed away some tears with his fist, with a confused intention of being a better fellow, going less to the holly bush down by the stone pit, and cleaning himself more regularly of a Sunday. In front of Sandy Jim stood Chad's Bess, who had shown an unwanted quietude and fixity of attention ever since Dinah had begun to speak. Not that the matter of the discourse had arrested her at once, for she was lost in a puzzling speculation as to what pleasure and satisfaction there could be in life to a young woman who wore a cap like Dinah's. Giving up this inquiry in despair, she took to studying Dinah's nose, eyes, mouth, and hair, and wondering whether it was better to have a, such a sort of pale face as that, or fat red cheeks and round black eyes like her own. But gradually the influence of the general gravity told upon her, and she became conscious of what Dinah was saying. The gentle tones, the loving persuasion did not touch her, but when the more severe appeals came she began to be frightened. Poor Bessie had always been considered a naughty girl. She was conscious of it. If it was necessary to be very good, it was clear she must be in a bad way. She couldn't find her places at church as Sally Rann could. She had often been tittering when she churchied to Mr. Irwine. And these religious deficiencies were accompanied by a corresponding slackness in the minor morals, for Bessie belonged unquestionably to that unsoaped lazy class of feminine characters with whom you may venture to eat an egg, an apple, or a nut. All this she was generally conscious of, and hitherto had not been greatly ashamed of it. But now she began to feel very much as if the constable had come to take her up and carry her before the justice, for some undefined offence. She had a terrified sense that God, whom she had always thought of as very far off, was very near to her, and that Jesus was close by looking at her, though she could not see him. For Dinah had that belief in visible manifestations of Jesus, which is common among the Methodists, and she communicated it irresistibly to her hearers. She made them feel that he was among them, bodily, and might at any moment show himself to them in some way that would strike anguish and penitence into their hearts. See, she exclaimed, turning to the left with her eyes fixed on a point above the heads of the people, see where our blessed Lord stands and weeps and stretches out his arms towards you. Hear what he says. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. And ye would not, she repeated, in a tone of pleading reproach, turning her eyes on the people again. See the print of the nails on his dear hands and feet. It is your sins that made them. Ah, oh, how pale and worn he looks. He has gone through all that great agony in the garden, when his soul was exceeding sorrowful even unto death and the great drops of sweat fell like blood to the ground. They spat upon him and buffeted him. They scourged him. They mocked him. They laid the heavy cross on his bruised shoulders. Then they nailed him up. What pain! His lips are parched with thirst, and they mock him still in this great agony. Yet with those parched lips he prays for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then a horror of great darkness fell upon him, and he felt what sinners feel when they are forever shut out from God. That was the last drop in the cup of bitterness. My God! My God! he cries, why hast thou forsaken me? All this he bore for you, for you, and you never think of him, for you, and you turn your backs on him. You don't care what he has gone through for you, yet he is not weary of toiling for you. He is risen from the dead. He is praying for you at the right hand of God. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he is upon this earth, too. He is among us. He is there close to you now. I see his wounded body and his look of love. Here Dinah turned to Bessie Cranage, whose bonny youth and evident vanity had touched her with pity. Poor child. Poor child. He is beseeching you, and you don't listen to him. You think of earrings and fine gowns and caps, and you never think of the Saviour who died to save your precious soul. Your cheeks will be shriveled one day, your hair will be grey, your poor body will be thin and tottering. Then you will begin to feel that your soul is not saved, 
then you will have to stand before god dressed in your sins in your evil tempers and vain thoughts and jesus who stands ready to help you now won't help you then because you won't have him to be your savior he will be your judge now he looks at you with love and mercy and says come to me that you may have life then he will turn away from you and say depart from me into everlasting fire poor bessie's wide open black eyes began to fill with tears her great red cheeks and lips became quite pale and her face was distorted like a little child's before a burst of crying ah oh, poor blind child dinah went on think if it should happen to you as it once happened to a servant of god in the days of her vanity she thought of her lace caps and saved all her money to buy em she thought nothing about how she might get a clean heart and a right spirit she only wanted to have better lace than other girls and one day when she put out her new cap on and looked in the glass she saw a bleeding face crowned with thorns that face is looking at you now here dinah pointed to a spot close in front of bessie ah tear off those follies cast them away from you as if they were stinging adders they are stinging you they are poisoning your soul they are dragging you down into a dark bottomless pit where you will sink forever forever and forever further away from light and god bessie could bear it no longer a great terror was upon her and wrenching her earrings from her ears she threw them down before her sobbing aloud her father chad frightened lest he should be laid hold on too this impression on the rebellious bess striking him as nothing less than a miracle walked hastily away and began to work at his anvil by way of reassuring himself folks mun a horseshoes preachin or no preachin the devil can a lay hold o me for that he muttered to himself but now dinah began to tell of the joys that were in store for the penitent and to describe in her simple way the divine peace and love with which the soul of the believer is filled how the sense of god's love turns poverty into riches and satisfies the soul so that no uneasy desire vexes it no fear alarms it how at last the very temptation to sin is extinguished and heaven is begun upon earth because no cloud passes between the soul and god who is its eternal son dear friends she said at last brothers and sisters whom i love as those for whom my lord has died believe me i know what this great blessedness is and because i know it i want you to have it too i am poor like you i have to get my living with my hands but no lord nor lady can be so happy as me if they haven't got the love of god in their souls think what it is not to hate anything but sin to be full of love to every creature to be frightened at nothing to be sure that all things will turn to good not to mind pain because it is our father's will to know that nothing no not if the earth was to be burnt up or the waters come and drown us nothing could part us from god who loves us and who fills our souls with peace and joy because we are sure that whatever he wills is holy just and good dear friends come and take this blessedness it is offered to you it is the good news that jesus came to preach to the poor it is not like the riches of this world so that the more one gets the less the rest can have god is without end his love is without end it streams the whole creation reach so plenteous is the store enough for all enough for each enough for evermore dinah had been speaking at least an hour and the reddening light of the parting day seemed to give a solemn emphasis to her closing words the stranger who had been interested in the course of her sermon as if it had been the development of a drama for there is this sort of fascination in all sincere unpremeditated eloquence which opens to one the inward drama of the speaker's emotions now turned his horse aside and pursued his way while dinah said let us sing a little dear friends and as he was still winding down the slope the voices of the methodists reached him rising and falling in that strange blending of exaltation and sadness which belongs to the cadence of a hymn end of chapter two chapter three of adam bede this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 3. After the Preaching. In less than an hour from that time, Seth Bede was walking by Dinah's side along the hedgerow path that skirted the pastures and green cornfields which lay between the village and the hall farm. Dinah had taken off her little Quaker bonnet again, and was holding it in her hands that she might have a freer enjoyment of the cool evening twilight, and Seth could see the expression of her face quite clearly as he walked by her side, timidly revolving something he wanted to say to her. It was an expression of unconscious placid gravity, of absorption in thoughts that had no connection with the present moment or with her own personality, an expression that is most of all discouraging to a lover. Her very walk was discouraging. It had that quiet elasticity that asks for no support. Seth felt this dimly. He said to himself, She's too good and holy for any man, let alone me and the words he had been summoning rushed back again before they had reached his lips. But another thought gave him courage. There's no man could love her better and leave her freer to follow the Lord's work. They had been silent for many minutes now, since they had done talking about Bessie Cranage. Dinah seemed almost to have forgotten Seth's presence and her pace was becoming so much quicker that the sense of there being only a few minutes' walk from the yard gates of the hall farm at last gave Seth courage to speak. "'You've quite made up your mind to go back to Snowfield, O oh Saturday, Dinah?' "'Yes,' said Dinah quietly. "'I'm called there. It was borne in upon my mind while I was meditating on Sunday night.' as Sister Ellen, who's in a decline, is in need of me. I saw her as plain as we see that bit of thin white cloud, lifting up her poor thin hand and beckoning to me. And this morning, when I opened the Bible for direction, the first words my eyes fell on were, and after we had seen the vision, immediately we endeavoured to go into Macedonia, if it wasn't for that clear showing of the Lord's will, I should be loath to go, for my heart yearns over my aunt and her little ones, and that poor wandering lamb, Hetty Sorrel. I've been much drawn out in prayer for her of late, and I look on it as a token that there may be mercy in store for her. God grant it, said Seth, for I doubt Adam's heart is so set on her. He'll never turn to anybody else, and yet it you'd go to my heart if he was to marry her, for I cannot think as she'd make him happy. It's a deep mystery, the way the heart of man turns to one woman, out of all the rest he's seen I, the world, and makes it easier for him to work seven year for her, like Jacob did for Rachel sooner than have any other woman for the asking. I often think of them words, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had to her. I know those words you'd come true with me, Dinah, if so be you'd give me hope, as I might win you after seven years was over. I know you think a husband you'd be taking up too much, or your thoughts, because St. Paul says, she's that's married careth for the thing of the world how she may please her husband, and may happen you'll think me over bold to speak to you about it again, after what you told me o oh, your mind last Saturday, but I've been thinking it over again by night and by day, and I prayed not to be blinded by my own desires, to think what's only good for me must be good for you too. And it seems to me there's more texts for your marrying than ever you can find against it. For St. Paul says as plain as can be in another place, 
I will that the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to adversary to speak reproachfully, and then two are better than one, and that holds good with marriage as well as with other things. For we should be o oh, one heart and o oh, one mind, Dinah. We both serve the same master, and are striving after the same gifts and I'd never be the husband to make a claim on you as could interfere with your doing the work God has fitted you for. I'd make a shift, and fend indoor and out, to give you more liberty, more than you can have now, for you've got to get your own living now, and I'm strong enough to work for us both. When Seth had once begun to urge his suit, he went on earnestly and almost hurriedly, lest Dinah should speak some decisive word before he had poured forth all the arguments he had prepared. His cheeks became flushed as he went on, his mild grey eyes filled with tears, and his voice trembled as he spoke the last sentence. They had reached one of those very narrow passes between two tall stones, which performed the office of a stile in Loamshire, and Dinah paused as she turned towards Seth, and said, in her tender but calm treble notes, Seth Bede, I thank you for your love towards me, and if I could think of any man as more than a Christian brother, I think it would be you. But my heart is not free to marry. That is good for other women." and it is a great and blessed thing to be a wife and mother, but, as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every man, so let him walk. God has called me to minister to others, not to have any joys or sorrows of my own, but to rejoice with them that do rejoice, and to weep with those that weep. He has called me to speak his word, and he has greatly owned my work. It could only be on a very clear showing that I could leave the brethren and sisters at Snowfield, who are favoured with very little of this world's good, where the trees are few, so that a child might count them, and there's very hard living for the poor in the winter. It has been given me to help, to comfort, and strengthen the little flock there, and to call in many wanderers. And my soul is filled with these things, from my rising up till my lying down. My life is too short, and God's work is too great for me to think of making a home for myself in this world. I've not turned a deaf ear to your words, Seth, for when I saw as your love was given to me, I thought it might be a leading of providence for me to change my way of life, and that we should be fellow helpers, and I spread the matter before the Lord. But whenever I tried to fix my mind on marriage, and our living together, other thoughts always came in, the times when I prayed by the sick and dying, and the happy hours I've had preaching, when my heart was filled with love, and the word was given to me abundantly. And when I've opened the Bible for direction, I've always lighted on some clear word to tell me where my work lay. I believe what you say, Seth, that you would try to be a help and not a hindrance to my work, but I see that our marriage is not God's will. He draws my heart another way. I desire to live and die without husband or children. I seem to have no room in my soul for wants and fears of my own. It has pleased God to fill my heart so full with the wants and sufferings of his poor people. Seth was unable to reply, and they walked on in silence. At last, as they were nearly at the yard gate, he said, Well, Dinah, I must seek for strength to bear it, and to endure as seeing him who is invisible. But I feel now how weak my faith is. It seems as if 
when you are gone, I could never joy in anything any more. I think it's something passing, the love of women, as I feel for you. For I could be content without your marrying me, if I could go and live at Snowfield and be near you. I trusted, as the strong love God has given me towards you, was a leading for us both. But it seems it was only meant for my trial. Perhaps I feel more for you than I ought to feel for any creature, for I often can't help saying of you what the hymn says. In darker shades, if she appear, my dawning is begun. She is my soul's bright morning star, and she my rising sun. That may be wrong, and I am to be taught better, but you wouldn't be displeased with me if things turned out so as I could leave this country and go to live at Snowfield? No, Seth, but I counsel you to wait patiently, and not lightly to leave your own country and kindred. Do nothing without the Lord's clear bidding. It's a bleak and barren country there, not like this land of Goshen you've been used to. We mustn't be in a hurry to fix and choose our own lot. We must wait to be guided. But you'd let me write you a letter, Dinah, if there was anything I wanted to tell you. Yes, sure, let me know if you're in any trouble. You'll be continually in my prayers. They had now reached the yard gate, and Seth said, I won't go in, Dinah, so farewell. He paused and hesitated after she had given him her hand, and then said, There's no knowing but what you may see things different after a while. There may be a new leading. Let us leave that, Seth. It's good to live only a moment at a time, as I've read in one of Mr. Wesley's books. It isn't for you and me to lay plans. We've nothing to do but to obey and to trust. Farewell. Dinah pressed his hand with rather a sad look in her loving eyes, and then passed through the gate, while Seth turned away to walk lingeringly home. But instead of taking the direct road, he chose to turn back along the fields through which he and Dinah had already passed, and I think his blue linen handkerchief was very wet with tears long before he had made up his mind that it was time for him to set his face steadily homewards. He was but three and twenty, and had only just learned what it is to love, to love with that adoration which a young man gives to a woman whom he feels to be greater and better than himself. Love of this sort is hardly distinguishable from religious feeling. What deep and worthy love is so, whether of woman or child, or art or music? Our caresses, our tender words, our still rapture under the influence of autumn sunsets, or pillared vistas, or calm majestic statues, or Beethoven sympathies all bring with them the consciousness that they are mere waves and ripples in unfathomable ocean of love and beauty. Our emotion in its keenest moment passes from expression into silence. Our love, at its highest flood, rushes beyond its object and loses itself in the sense of divine mystery. And this blessed gift of venerating love has been given to too many humble craftsmen since the world began for us to feel any surprise that it should have existed in the soul of a Methodist carpenter half a century ago. While there was yet a lingering afterglow from the time when Wesley and his fellow labourer fed on the hips and haws of the Cornwall hedges, after exhausting limbs and lungs in carrying a divine message to the poor. That afterglow has long faded away, and the picture we are apt to make of Methodism in our imagination is not an amphitheatre of green hills, or the deep shade of broad-leaved sycamores, where a crowd of rough men 
and weary-hearted women drunk in a faith which was a rudimentary culture, which linked their thoughts with the past, lifted their imagination above the sordid details of their own narrow lives, and suffused their souls with the sense of a pitying, loving, infinite presence, sweet as summer to the houseless needy. It is too possible that to some of my readers Methodism may mean nothing more than a low-pitched gables, up dingy streets, sleek grocers, sponging preachers, and hypocritical jargon, elements which are regarded as an exhaustive analyst of Methodism in many fashionable quarters. That would be a pity, for I cannot pretend that Seth and Dinah were anything else than Methodists, not indeed of that modern type which reads quarterly reviews and attends in chapels with pillared porticos, but of a very old-fashioned kind. They believed in present miracles, in instantaneous conversations, in revelations by dreams and visions. They drew lots and sought for divine guidance by opening the Bible at hazard, having a literal way of interpreting the scriptures, which is not at all sanctioned by approved commentators, and it is impossible for me to represent their diction as correct, or their instruction as liberal. Still, if I have read religious history aright, faith, hope, and charity have not always been found in a direct ratio with a sensibility to the three concords, and it is possible, thank heaven, to have very erroneous theories and very sublime feelings. The raw bacon which clumsy Molly spares from her own scanty store, that she may carry it to her neighbour's child to stop the fits, may be a piteously inefficacious remedy, but the generous stirring of neighbourly kindness that prompted the deed has a beneficent radiation that is not lost. Considering these things, we can hardly think Dinah and Seth beneath our sympathy, accustomed as we may be to weep over the loftier sorrows of heroines in satin boots and crinoline, and of heroes riding fiery horses, themselves ridden by still more fiery passions. Poor Seth, he was never on horseback in his life except once, when he was a little lad, and Mr. Jonathan Burge took him up behind, telling him to hold on tight, and instead of bursting out into wild accusing apostrophes to God and destiny, he is resolving, as he now walks homewards under the solemn starlight, to repress his sadness, to be less bent on having his own will, and to live more for others, as Dinah does. End of chapter 3